Hey everybody, my name is Ken Falk. Uh, there's been questions before about how to upgrade your Godox, you know, speed lights, triggers, um, you know, your, your, your giant mono blocks, um, and how to do that on the Mac. And um, I had put out one video already about this and I got a lot of great feedback on it. So I wanted to incorporate some of the feedback into somewhat of, of an updated video, uh, updated version of that same video. Um, there have been a few small changes within Mac OS that make you, you know, change certain requirements uh, from a security standpoint um, and just kind of cover uh, some things that maybe I made some uh, assumptions uh, in the first video uh, that I can hopefully correct this time around. So um, what you've got here is actually this is a very uh, pretty much a clean install of Mac OS. I've uh, just installed a few of uh, the bare essentials here, uh, but anything that you would need to actually install to do this task, um, I'm going to cover in this video. So. First things first, um, you want to go to godox.com and go to their firmware download page to download copies of both, uh, or I'm sorry, the Godox G1 updater or the Godox G2 updater, depending upon which piece of uh, Godox gear it is you're looking to update. And they list it down here, um, you know, which ones correspond with which. So if, for example, if it's an AD200 uh, or any of these pieces of equipment, you would use the G2 updater. If it's uh, any of these, then it'd be, it would fall under line here under the G1. Um, but uh, that's the first thing you want to do is make sure you get those, those installers, the Godox G1 or G2 installer, and then the corresponding firmware. And those installers, uh, they, they actually come down as a RAR file, an RAR file. Um, I know some people had some, some uh, difficulties uh, uncompressing the RAR file. Uh, the best, easiest way to do that is to use Kekka. Uh, I'm a big fan of Kekka. Um, just go to kekeosx.com, and here you can download uh, the Kekka, uh, you know, compressor, de decompressor archiver tool. And to install that, just go into your downloads folder, which is where Safari will save it natively. Double click that to mount that uh, DMG file. And then this will just be as simple as dragging that into our applications folder, um, you know, very similar to any other uh, Mac OS installation uh, for like, like any other similar software. So um, once you, we've got that installed, um, all we would need to do is come here to applications or if you want, you know, you can use the, uh, uh, the dashboard, you know, version of this. Um, open Kekka, it's going to prompt you to say, you know, are you sure you want to do this? Go ahead and choose OK. Choose OK. Um, for uh, general, you know, uh, options here, uh, we can choose perform automatic action where it'll actually detect um, whatever is, is the default answer or whatever is the default action. That's fine. I would actually just close this. Um, and then what I would do here is just go back to your downloads folder, drag this RAR file on top of uh, Kekka, and you'll see there that will go ahead and make uh, your that'll that'll actually extract this uh, both of these raw files into separate little uh, folders. And then once you got those, you can safely delete those raw files behind you. Um, you're good to go, and uh, you can actually close out your Kekka installer and clean this up here. Uh, that point we're now done with Kekka. We don't need it. Um, you could actually uninstall it if you want. I actually I like to keep it around. I just think it's actually a very handy, very easy to use uh, compression utility uh, for stuff like that for for uh, you know gzip or raw uh, win you know stuff like that. Um, uh, so our next step then is we need to actually download er, uh, Oracle VirtualBox. So from VirtualBox.org, you'll just click on OS 10 hosts, and uh, when you do that. It's gonna, you know, initiate, you know, create this download for you here. Um, you can see uh, it's it's a pretty quick download. It's it's only gonna take me a little bit of time here. I'm on a pretty uh, speedy connection, but I've actually already got these uh, got this downloaded. So I'll just double click the VirtualBox 5.2 DMG file here. Um, this one's installation is uh, where some people were getting hung up uh, on the last video. So. Uh, it actually requires some elevated privileges. So you just double click this virtualbox.package. It's gonna prompt to say, you know, the, the computer needs to run some, uh, needs to check and make sure that it, it's okay to run this. Go ahead and hit continue and go continue, hit install. And at this point, you know, if you've got one of the fancy schmancy new Macs that's got the touch ID, you can use your touch ID. Otherwise it might prompt for your administrator password. Uh, but either way, you have to give it a go ahead here to actually perform the uh, VirtualBox installation and we'll allow this to run. 
And here you can see, this is where people were getting, uh, getting hung up here. So um, this, this is new as of a recent update to either VirtualBox or to uh, Mac OS High Sierra. Um, we need to go into the security preferences and tell it that it's okay for Oracle to run a uh, system extension. And uh, this is a vital, uh, important part here. And you can see, if we click on that open button, it's gonna take us straight here and say system software was blocked from loading. Go ahead and set that to allow come back and we will choose keep and we, we actually just need to launch that installer a second time um, when we run it through though this time however because we've given the system uh, permission to run that one time now when it tries to run through and make that same attempt it's actually gonna work okay and now you can see we have a successful uh, installation of the software um, you know at this point if you want you can move this to the trash you don't need to keep it that's up to you um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmount that so that allows us to install the actual uh, VirtualBox platform. We do also need this VM VirtualBox extension pack. And this is uh, very key in terms of allowing uh, USB 2 and USB 3 devices to actually connect through and talk to the Windows Virtual Machine. Um, so same thing, go ahead and click that. Uh, I've already got this installed actually. So what we need to do is launch VirtualBox. And you'll see that once we've uh, launched VirtualBox, we can jump back over to our downloads folder where we now have that, that ext pack ready to go. Simply double click on that and uh, VirtualBox will accept this and it'll, it'll say, hey, we've noticed you're trying to install VirtualBox extension pack. Uh, go ahead and do so, choose install. Um, after carefully reading all of these terms and conditions, assuming that you agree with them, go ahead and click I agree. Um, from here, you'll need to uh, enter your uh, supervisor administrative credentials uh, within uh, OS 10 to allow that, or I'm sorry, Mac OS. Uh, to allow that to complete. So now that we have successfully installed VirtualBox, we need to download a uh, virtual machine image that will allow us to actually run a session of Windows from within VirtualBox. So to do that, we can go to uh, developer.microsoft.com. I'll provide a link in the uh, YouTube uh, video description so you can come right here. And then from here, I would just choose uh, the IE11 on Windows 7 platform. Um, I find Windows 7 is just the easiest one to work with. For platform, make sure you select VirtualBox and then choose Download Zip. Um, you can see here, this is a very large download. Um, this one you know, actually comes in at about uh, just over five gigs. Um, I've went ahead and pre-downloaded that to, so we can save uh, everyone from having to watch that. And once again, depending upon your the way you've got your Mac OS configured, it might automatically extract that zip. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, what you'll see happens though, is as soon as we are done extracting this zip, it's going to give us a new, um, it's actually a template for a virtual machine. So um, it's gonna give us this .ova file here, um, which is an open virtualization archive file. And you'll see here, once this is done um, on archiving, we have got a new folder here labeled ie11-win7 so um, all you need to do is double click on that uh, new file that's in here it's the one that's the ie11-win7-ovf and it's already pre-configured with a lot of information about uh, what this uh, system is going to look like so you know is it going to be you know, windows how many cpus how much ram do you want to al allocate to it all these things um, all of these uh, default uh, values that are here are, are completely fine. So go ahead and just click import. And as you do this, you're gonna see it's going to actually begin uh, importing this virtual disk image and creating a new virtual machine for you. So uh, this is, you know, this might be pretty time consuming. So I will go ahead and skip forward uh, at this point in the video to save everybody some time. Okay, excellent. It is done importing them, importing this virtual machine. And so now you can see here, uh, we've got a Windows uh, 7 box here. And there are a few settings changes that we're gonna make uh, right now. Uh, first thing we need to do is come over here to storage and actually add an optical disk drive. So to do that, we just come down here, click on this little uh, add disk button here, add optical drive. Um, we we'll can choose leave empty for now. Um, we're gonna use this uh, once we're inside the guest operating system to install uh, some special drivers. And then come over here, click on ports, click on USB. We definitely need to enable the USB controller. And then specifically, we want to select USB 2 uh, EHCI controller. Select that, then click OK. And then once we've done that, we can power on our virtual machine by clicking that start button. 
And now for devices, I'm going to go to Insert Guest Editions CD Image. And when I do that, it's going to say, okay, do we want to run this? Go ahead and choose yes. And this just allows us to install um, necessary drivers, things that will allow a uh, USB bus to work, uh, important things like that. And it's going to request a reboot. That's completely normal. Go ahead and allow it to reboot. OK, now that this is rebooted, we want to be able to drag files from our downloads folder in the Mac world into the Windows world. And to do that, we come here to uh, Windows, or I'm sorry, to Devices up here at top, go to Drag and Drop, and then say Allow Host to Guest, or we could do Bidirectional, which allows it to go uh, both ways. But I'll do Host to Guest, and now I can actually just drag and drop those two folders that were on my uh, within my downloads folder there uh, in the the Mac downloads folder right here to the desktop of my uh, Windows machine, and then from here I can just run these installers uh, just as if it was any other Windows app installer here. So just double click the you know go to XG2 installer, uh, choose I agree, hit next, hit next. Oops. And put in my name. Next, next, and allow finish. Um, it's very, it's completely natural. After that finishes, it's going to prompt to install device driver. Go ahead and choose yes. That's completely fine. Choose finish. Okay. So we did the G2. Now let's do the uh, G1 uh, software. Same thing. Next. Uh, of course, we carefully read all of this. Next. I'll put in my name because it requires it. Next. Next, next. Once again, this will prompt to install drivers. So hit next or finish. Next. Um, you may get a warning here and the say Windows can't verify that. That's fine. Go ahead and choose install this driver software anyway. Uh, normally, that's typically not going to be a good idea, but in this particular case, we know it's it's so. Um, I just like to keep all the Godox firmware uh, in my Dropbox folder here. Uh, it's just handy. Um, as just to as an example, I'm going to update a uh, TT685F. Uh, it's a Fuji-based 685, and I'm just going to drag and drop that FRI file to the desktop, and that uses the Godox G2 software, I think. Actually, hold on. I'm not sure if that one uses the G2 or the G1. Yep, uses G1. Okay, great. Uh, we want to allow USB access to uh, allow for it to talk to our uh, actual Godox product here. So to do that, I just come here, click on this, this USB icon right here, choose ATMEL USB Godox, and uh, that will actually, uh, it's kind of more or less it just plugs in um, the Godox device into uh, the system. Once we've done that, we can hit the Godox G1, select file, and browse this to that FRI uh, file. And when we hit connect, you'll see that we successfully connected. Uh, we can hit upgrade. And when we hit upgrade, that's going to actually erase the old firmware and then rewrite it uh, with the new updated firmware. Hit disconnect and exit. And now if we pull up our uh, TT685, look at the firmware version on it, it will reflect that it is that version 1.1. And you simply repeat this process for uh, any of the Godox devices. So looks like I've got here, this is actually a Nikon uh, X1T trigger. Um, so just to show you how this one would be done, um, I'm going to actually unscrew this, that, and take out the batteries because of course, once again, we don't want any, pow any uh, power source running into this. And here, um, it's just got a rubber gasket on the side that, uh, if you have fingernails, super handy for getting into. I'm struggling it a little bit here. Suppose you could use the battery door hinge. There we go. And uh, once that's open, just plug in this micro USB port. And in this case, uh, this is a Nikon uh, trigger. So you'll come here to X1T, uh, and it would be the XT1N. Um, looks like version uh, 24 is the newest one that I've got. So you do that, and once again, just drag and drop that over here to the desktop. Um, the XT1 triggers do use the G1 updater, so launch the G1, 
X1TN. Uh, we can see it's matching product. Um, I do need to you know, plug this in. Same thing here, so it'll be the ATMEL DUF Godox. Um, you can do that, it's gonna install the device driver. Um, it searches Windows Update, but you can actually skip that by just clicking on Skip Obtain Device Driver. It'll give you a warning of, are you sure that's what you wanna do? Uh, that's fine. The Godox USB driver that it installed um, at the time of uh, the install for the G1, um, you can see here uh, that's that allows it to successfully communicate with it. So uh, same thing here, just hit uh, the upgrade button and we'll get an erase success, a write success, and an upgrade success. So from there I'll hit disconnect and exit. And basically it's the exact same process uh, for any of your Godox tools that you have. Um, you know, be the Godox X Pro triggers, uh, the 8200s, the 8600s. Um, but really, it's, it's just you need to make sure that you install the G1, the G2 properly here in the guest OS, and then just make sure that under devices, USB, that you do have that checked, whichever that device is. And they'll pop up with different names. Um, it typically does say something about Godox, though. Whatever it is, it might, it might be a different series of letters before it, but it'll say Godox. Um, but that's basically it. So if you have any questions, feel free to you know, like or comment, um, you know, comment on the video. Um, I'll try to do my best to be as responsive and get back to you on there, or uh, catch up with me on Facebook. Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, however you want to get a hold of me. Um, but yeah, I just want to let you know it's not impossible, and these are all completely free uh, utilities, uh, no charge for any of these. Uh, so good luck, and uh, have a good time shooting. Thanks, everyone.